So here we are at the last video that I'll give on the hylomorphic conception of the human person. You might wonder why I've been spending so much time talking about the ins and outs and pros and cons of hylomorphism. Mostly because I think it is the right view, or at least a really strong competitor in the contemporary debates. It uh, has more tricks up its sleeve and captures uh, some important elements in the human person, I think, better than other views. On the flip side, you might wonder, well, if you do, if you are so convinced that hylomorphism is the best view, or at least a really strong competitor, why did we spend the whole first half of the course exploring views that you think are inadequate, are ultimately not as good as hylomorphism? I think there are a couple answers to that question. One, because I think it's really important to enter into the mind of someone who holds these other views, to see that they're not stupid views, that in order to argue against them, you'd have to know them better right, than even the people who uh, advocate for these sorts of views. In order to really know how to argue persuasively against these views, you have to see what makes uh, them tick, right? You have to see what are the really good reasons that people can give for thinking that these views are true. The other main reason that I spent so much time on the other sorts of views is because, right, now you're starting to see, based on my cumulative case for hylomorphism last time, is I focused on these puzzles, these arguments, because I think that once you pull them all together, it really helps to see why hylomorphism is such a, in my mind, compelling view, persuasive, um, uh, why it's such a, uh, a serious competitor in the contemporary debate, because it captures some of the good things about the other views, because it can solve some of the puzzles and the problems for those other views. It's in a way I've all sort of been setting up for um, showing why hylomorphism is a really great view of the human person. I could have started out with just by doing hylomorphism. Here's the view that I think is right, but I don't think that would have been, I don't think that would have been helpful for you, and I don't think you would have found it nearly as persuasive. Only by looking at the other views and seeing their various uh, positive and negative features can you really appreciate what hylomorphism can do as a theory of the human person. And also, if all I taught you was hylomorphism, then you wouldn't be able to talk with anyone else outside of that tradition. You wouldn't even know how to describe the view to someone else who doesn't hold it. You wouldn't know how to argue persuasively against other people who hold other views that you disagree with. And so that's why I've spent so much time focusing on hylomorphism, and that's why I've spent so much time um, building up to it by focusing on the other views. Very few people accept the hylomorphic understanding of the human person. I've been having you read a lot about it, but there's actually not a whole lot beyond that. It's a minority position, to be sure. And so a lot of people do not find the hylomorphic worldview, do not find the hylomorphic account of the human per person compelling. They think there are way too many complications that it introduces. They think that it introduces way too many problems. And so this is actually what I want to focus on in this lecture here. To give a really fair presentation of hylomorphism, I think I also need to spend some time talking about with what are some potential worries for hylomorphism? Why doesn't everyone find it compelling or persuasive? Um, what is it that sort of keeps me awake at night um, in terms of uh, if I really want to effectively argue for this view, right? What concerns do I have about defending this view? What do I have the most trouble with in explaining it to other people? And so I'm going to talk about uh, four possible concerns or worries uh, for hylomorphism. They are listed at the bottom of your chart for hylomorphism, but there's also a separate uh, handout. There's also a separate set of notes called objections to hylomorphism. And I want to start with actually maybe the biggest one, um, the one that I am the most concerned about. Um, this is the concern uh, that according to hylomorphism um, forms, some forms, namely rational souls, can survive without their matter. The worry is that this just sounds incoherent. How could a form exist without its matter? Here's the way that I've described uh, the problem on the notes. According to hylomorphism, the rational soul is both the form of the body, the configurational state of your matter, and something capable of existing and acting on its own after the death, after the death of the body. But how could one thing be both a configurational state and a subsistent being that is something that can exist and act on its own? On the hylomorphic picture, the rational soul seems to be both a thing in itself and a state that the matter is in, but nothing can be both a thing and a state. That's like something being both a number and a color. It just doesn't make any sense. Not only right, do we have empirical evidence to think that it's false, but we have logical evidence to think that it couldn't possibly be true. It's incoherent. 
So here's a statement of the problem um, from a book on um, philosophy of mind and the human person um, from James Madden, Mind, Matter, and Nature. And here's the way that he describes the problem. The problem is that organizational states, configurations, shapes, and the like are all abstract entities, properties, or ways of being, but definitely not things that can exist without something organized, configured, or shaped. In short, by what seems to be the Hylomorphous' own definition of form, the notion of a separable form is incoherent. Forms are states of matter, not subsistent entities. As soon as the hylomorphist argues for the separability of the soul, forms seem to cease to be properties or ways of being, which contradicts the main thrust of, hy of hylomorphist philosophy of nature. On the one hand, the hylomorphist emphasizes form as an abstract entity when distinguishing his position from dualism, and on the other hand, the hylomorphist presents form as though it were a kind of concrete particular, a subsistent entity, when giving an account of human nature and the possibility for survival of bodily death. This all looks like a logically inconsistent case of trying to have your cake and eat it too. Um, to really capture the essence of this worry, elsewhere the problem is called the Cheshire Cat uh, problem. Um, remember the Cheshire Cat from Alice in Wonderland is the sort of case where we have the smile of the cat existing after the cat has gone. But how can you have a smile without a cat? How can you have a smile without a face? This is supposed to be similar to the claim that hylomorphism is making. How can you have form without matter? How can there be a form of something that doesn't exist? So it's a bit like saying that we could have a smile without a face. You can't have a smile without a face. A smile just is the way that a face is. It is incoherent to say that something could exist uh, in such a in, in, in that way. And this is why uh, Alice in Wonderland is sort of funny. Uh, Lewis Carroll is a philosopher. He's a logician um, poking fun at um, this impossibility which, we, which he builds into the story. I think this is a serious worry for hylomorphism. What must their conception of form be such that it can be both so tightly tied to the matter that it's like the impression or it's like the configurational state, but also it is such that it can survive without that matter, without that body. The idea of what a form is, that uh, the conception of form that Aristotle and Aquinas must have in order to make that even coherent must be some other way of thinking about form um, than we've been thinking about thus far. And indeed, this has been part of my project and some of my research, trying to figure out what sort of conception of form must they have had in mind such that they didn't, obvious, didn't see that this is obviously incoherent. They must have had a more expansive, more functional account of what a form is such that it could serve both functions, whatever it is. So anyway, I think this is a serious worry for hylomorphism. I think that it's something um, that hylomorphists have to respond to if they're going to be successful. If they're going to persuade anyone of uh, not not only the uh, that the view is true, but that it even makes sense. Here's a second worry for hylomorphism, that even if my soul survives, it wouldn't be me. I, a human animal, am essentially composed of both form and matter, soul and body. And so even if my soul could survive the death of my body, the animal that I am would not. And so this worry for hylomorphism says that, okay, great, maybe you can show that the soul survives the death of the body, but that doesn't really help us in terms of the afterlife because it wouldn't be me. I am the animal. I'm a compound of soul and body. So even if you could um, show that some part of me continues on, it wouldn't be me. And so why should I care about that? Right? It's like um, you can show that my shoe can exist without me. Okay, great. But why, if my shoe continues on after I'm dead, why should I care about that? Well, the shoe will be cleaned and well taken care of. Who cares, right? If it's not me, right? Why should I care about that kind of sense of some something that once belonged to me um, now surviving without me? And we'll talk a little bit about this problem when we talk about how the morphs in the afterlife later on. And indeed, both of those first two worries have something to do with its account of the afterlife. The third and fourth are less about the afterlife, though the, the third one starts from that, but it's really just a general worry about hylomorphism, even setting its account of the afterlife aside. So here's the third worry or objection to hylomorphism, something that we can call the thinking soul objection. What the worry here says is that hylomorphism seems to get around the thinking part objection, but maybe not so fast, right? It seems to have an additional thinker besides the animal, namely the soul. It looks like Aquinas is committed to saying that the soul does indeed think. And if the soul thinks and the animal thinks, then we've got too many thinkers. Indeed, a, a problem of too many thinkers that regular animalism doesn't have to contend with. So advantage standard animalism? Here's the formulation of the problem as it appears on the handout. According to hylomorphism, my 
soul survives the death of my body, even though it seems I, the human animal, do not. And in its separated state, the soul can think. It can at least engage in the contemplation of abstract universal nature, since, as St. Thomas argues, that operation does not require any bodily organ. But if my soul can think when it is separated from the body, why can't it do so when joined with the body? And if we say that it can do so, doesn't that mean that when present in the body, both my soul and I can think? Isn't this too many thinkers? Who is thinking my thoughts here? Me or my soul or both of us? Here's a statement of the problem from Toner in the article that I had you guys read. It's on page 72 to 73. Quote, according to hylomorphism, we humans are body-soul compounds. Many hylomorphic theorists claim our souls survive the death of those body-soul compounds. But of course, the soul is not an animal, so hylomorphic animals should deny the human person survived the death. Then the question is, can the soul after death think? If so, it's a rival candidate for being me. For if it can think after I die, why say it can't think when I'm alive? And once again, this introduces another problem of too many thinkers. One that um, standard animalism doesn't have to contend with. And indeed, any non uh, soul theory doesn't have to contend with. This seems like a unique problem for hylomorphism. Um, Toner has a response to this, and you can see what he says in his article in response to this, but I think it's a worry that hylomorphists have to contend with. Here's the last worry for hylomorphism. This has to do with, you guessed it, its unicity doctrine. This wild and controversial claim that all the parts depend all of your parts depend for their existence and identity on the whole that you are. It has all sorts of radical implications that seem to conflict heavily with how things uh, appear to us. And so maybe I'll state, really press on the counterintuitiveness of this claim here. Um, according to the no substantial parts doctrine, none of my parts are themselves substances. Each of my parts depends for its existence and its identity on me, the whole of which it is part. We have seen that this doctrine makes available to the hylomorphist new solutions to, to various puzzles about personal identity, but it can also have some strikingly counterintuitive implications. It means that at the moment that I come into existence, all of my material contributions from my parents cease to exist, having been fused together to compose me. It means that whenever something ceases to be a part of me, it ceases to exist and gives rise to a new substance that looks and acts a lot like that was once a part of me. It means that when I die, nothing of what is now a part of me remains after I'm gone. Notice how bonkers this is. It means that when I donate a kidney to someone in need, there is not one but three kidneys involved in this transaction. There is the kidney that is essentially a part of me, there is the new kidney, or whatever it is, that comes into existence when my kidney is removed from me, and there is the new kidney that is created when the second kidney is successfully transplanted. But it certainly looks like there is just one kidney involved in this process, the very same kidney throughout. Notice, too, that this would mean that the hylomorphist is going to have to tell a very complicated story when describing what happens in a cerebrum transplant scenario. So to really push on the counterintuitive implications of the no substantial parts doctrine, it means that an organ transplants, right? We've actually got three kidneys involved when it, all, when it seems like there's just one. And indeed, you can sort of track like a water molecule, right? As it's in your glass, and as you drink it, it becomes a part of you, and then as you expel it, maybe through sweat. According to hylomorphism, there are actually three water molecules involved when it really looks like there is just one. And so hylomorphism has to say some really funny things, and especially, as I said here, applied to like cerebrum transplant cases or brain transplant cases, they're going to have to apply this to that. There's going to be new things popping into existence all over the place. It's going to have perhaps a real problem with the remnant person problem um, because of its commitment um, to the no substantial parts doctrine. It's going to have things popping in and out of existence all over the place. We've seen that it can use this unicity doctrine to solve various other puzzles about the human person. But is that enough? Is that enough to really overcome just how counterintuitive this doctrine is? Does it do enough work for us to sort of um, swallow that pill, um, to bite that bullet, to say that, okay, yes, despite its counterintuitiveness, it does so much work that we should accept the innocent doctrine? I don't know. Uh, I think the jury's still out on that one. I think Heinemorphus would really have to push the advantages of the innocent doctrine to overcome its counterintuitive implications. So then what I've done here is I've introduced four worries or concerns for hylomorphism. There's the Cheshire Cat objection, which wonders whether the idea of a form without its matter is even coherent. There's the worry that all the time it's been showing that the soul could survive without the body is sort of irrelevant because it wouldn't be me. 
there's the thinking soul objection, which says that it looks like if the soul can think without us, then why isn't it thinking right now when it's part of us? And so then we might have too many thinkers, the soul and the animal. And then finally, there are all sorts of counterintuitive implications of the no substantial parts doctrine. It just flagrantly goes against how things appear to us. And you might think that that's just too much, that no matter how many advantages it has, right, that's just too much to take. That is a strong reason to think that hylomorphism can't be the right theory of the human person. There ought to be a better one that can solve some of those puzzles without bringing in those counterintuitive implications. So put together, it means that hylomorphism still has some work to do. I think the cumulative case that I discussed last time gives us ample motivation to keep on working through hylomorphism to try to figure out these worries, but it also means that it's not done. Hylomorphism is not a slam dunk. Anyone who disagrees with hylomorphism is not dumb for that reason. There are pretty, some pretty good reasons to doubt that hylomorphism is indeed the very best theory of the human person. And so I think hylomorphists still have some work to do. Um, they would still have to have something to say about these main objections that they really wanted to persuade more people that it is the right view. And so in some ways, right, as we've gone through these various theories of the human person, on the one hand, I want to teach you how to more persuasively argue against uh, the views that you think are wrong. But I also want to give you the sense that, well, look, um, the game's not over. We're still working. This is still a project. We're still working to figure out which theory of the human person is the right one. I've given some reasons to think that hylomorphism at least is a very promising uh, way of understanding the human person. We still have a lot of work to do to determine that this is, in fact, uh, the best theory. There's still all sorts of problems and worries. There are counter replies to various objections that I've raised to other views, right? The conversation is ongoing. And so the reason why I spent so much uh, of the course carefully going through all of these views is not just to show you how best to argue with other people, but because I'm inviting you into this ongoing conversation. I need your help in helping me figure out how best to argue in favor of hylomorphism and against the other views. If you agree with me that this has enough advantages that makes it worth defending, that makes it worth, worth uh, pursuing in more detail. So at the end of the day, what I wanted to try to give you is an overview of all the theories of the human person not because I just want to teach you about this closed conversation, but because I want to invite you into this conversation, because I think it's so vitally important that you join in, that you have something to say, that you add to the discussion, that you push it forward, that you uh, push it further. Why? Because I think it matters so much that we get this right. And so in the remainder of the course, I want to focus on several particular ethical issues or practical issues in which it becomes abundantly clear how, just how important it is that we get this right, that we figure out what is the right uh, view of the human person and we be able to persuasively argue in favor of it. In the next couple of lectures, in the remainder of the course, we'll be looking at issues related to the beginning of life, issues related to the end of life, issues related to the afterlife, and then I'll give one lecture on the relationship between these debates about personal identity and issues in sex and gender. But that's it in terms of just going over the theories of the human person. You now have everything it seems that you need in order to try to figure out and to help me figure out which of these views is the right view. Is it the biological approach? Is it some version of animalism? Is it some version of the psychological approach? Is it some version of soul theory? Is it substance dualism or hylomorphism? I'm interested in your thoughts, and I'm really eager to encourage you to jump into this discussion and to move it forward to help us all figure out what the right answer is. Thanks very much.